Well, today I want to continue, we want to continue a series that we began three weeks ago that we have entitled Release. Somebody say release. release. Somebody say it again. Say release. release. In this series, we're learning how to respond biblically to life's offenses. Jesus said in Luke that offenses will certainly come. It's a part of life. If you live long enough, you will run into people who don't say it right, people who don't do it right, and we're learning how God wants us to respond to those offenses. In lesson one, we talked about what forgiveness is not. In lesson number two, we talked about what is forgiveness. How do we understand forgiveness? And on last week, we looked at why should we forgive? Why is forgiveness important? And in this fourth lesson, I want to teach from this topic how to overcome offense. If Jesus said that offenses will come, it's not a matter of if you're going to be offended, it's a matter of when. How do we overcome them? How do we ensure that we don't get stuck in the past, don't get stuck in the hurt? I want to use as a backdrop for the teaching a story from the life of Jesus is found in several of the Gospels, in Matthew and Mark and Luke. I'm going to share the story. We won't look at the verses. But in Mark chapter 6, we find Jesus at the very beginning of his ministry. He's a grown man in his 30s. He's launched out from his hometown, from his family, and he's traveling around to various cities teaching the good news of the gospel and performing miracles. A crowd has now become attached to him. He now has disciples. People are following his teaching. His social media following is growing. And in Mark chapter 6, Jesus decides to take his ministry, to take his teaching back to his hometown. He was born in Bethlehem, but Jesus was raised up in the city of Nazareth, and Mark says that one weekend, Jesus went back to his hometown of Nazareth. Now, we would all imagine that if you're going back home, if you're going back with mom and them and cousin and them, this is a friendly group. These are people who know you. These are people who are going to be receptive to you. Jesus went to church that weekend in his hometown, got up in the pulpit to teach a sermon. The Bible says that as he began to teach, the entire congregation was amazed. They're elbowing each other. Hey, this is Jesus. Hey, Jesus is back home. Hey, this, this, is, this is our hometown where people are smiling. They're grinning. But Jesus is about to quickly find out something that maybe all of us have experienced, and that is this, just because people smile in your face does not mean that they're for you. Jesus, the story, the congregation, the, the sermon is about to go left real quick. Jesus is about to learn that in this life, as many of us have come to realize, all of us at one point or another will face moments where others will reject us, where others will push us away, where they won't embrace us. And if we're honest, if we're honest, none of us like to feel rejected. Students, you tried out for the team. You really wanted to be on it, but they cut you. You applied for the job, you applied for the promotion, but got turned down. You asked her out on a date, and she said, no, nah, I'm good. I just want to be friends. How do you respond? How do you feel when what you want doesn't want you. Jesus is continuing the sermon, but he can begin to see, hey, these smiles on these faces, they're starting to turn. The people that I thought were going to be for me, the people that I thought was going to be receptive to this message, it's starting to turn, not in my favor. And the Bible says, it uses the word scoffs. The congregation rejects Jesus. They are rejecting his message. And they began to say among themselves, he's just a carpenter. His mom is Mary. We know his brothers. His sisters live just around the corner, right, right, right around the corner from us. And the scripture says in Mark that the congregation rejected Jesus to the point because they were deeply offended. Not just offended, 
Mark says that the congregation was deeply offended at Jesus, and they did not believe in him. Now, I've preached many a sermons in my day. Some have been better than others, but I've never had an entire congregation to respond by telling me that they were deeply offended. In fact, if we read this same homegoing celebration that Jesus is having in other translations, other chapters, other gospel writers say that the congregation was so upset, they were so offended at whatever Jesus was saying that they took Jesus out of church, took him to a hill, and tried to throw him off. Now, I got to ask the question as a preacher, because I'm preaching this lesson. What in the world did he say from that pulpit that offended the people like that? You may not like my message, but you ain't going to try to throw me off of a cliff because of it. What in the world did he say? Well, the gospel writer of Luke over in Luke chapter 4 tells us what Jesus was teaching on. He says that when Jesus went home, this is a hometown friendly crowd. These are the people who are supposed to have his back. Luke says that Jesus got up in the pulpit, got a scroll, got the Bible, and began to read a text that would have been very familiar to this Jewish crowd. He began to read from the book of Isaiah. He began to tell this crowd, the people who had grown up with him, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the hurting, to bind up those who are wounded. In other words, Jesus was declaring before this congregation, God is sending a Messiah to rescue his people, and this day, I be the one. I am the promised Messiah that God has told you about. Now imagine you are in the congregation. You are listening to somebody that you grew up with. You ain't seen them in a while. You went to school with them. You played with them. Y'all linked up this week at the Classic after not having seen each other for a while. And as you're catching up with them, you ask them, okay, how's life been? What are you up to now? And they begin to tell you how God has anointed them. They began to tell you how God has empowered them to help people who are broken. In fact, in fact, they are the one that God has sent to redeem mankind. What are you thinking about your friend? You're probably thinking that he or she has lost their mind. You're probably thinking, okay, I ain't seen you in a minute, but uh, we got to get you some help. And the congregation was thinking the same thing about Jesus. We know him to be the son of God. We know that we know him to be the Messiah. But this is a person that they went to school with. It's people in this congregation who helped raise him. He's not Jesus to them. This is little Jesus. I went to school with little Jesus. I was in the wood shop with little Jesus. They called him a carpenter. That was not a compliment. What they were saying is, just a few months ago, I took my dinner table to his shop to get fixed. This the same guy who was fixing our rocking chair. And now he is telling me that he has come to save me. This little Jesus. The Bible says that they were deeply offended at him, and their offense blocked what God wanted to do and was even able to do in that city. Talking about how to overcome offense, we're going to use this story of Jesus as a background. I'm going to refer to it as we're going through some of the teaching points in the lesson. Let's talk first about offense. What is it? Offense is a feeling of being insulted slighted or wrong. The congregation is feeling insulted. Who do you think you are? Who said I needed to be saved? I am believing God, Jehovah, for a Messiah. I promise you, Lord Jesus, you are not him. They're offended. 
They're slight at. What is offense? Is unresolved hurt or resentment? What is offense? It's anything that becomes a hindrance to others and causes them to fall by the way. When you get over into a place of offense, you can't move forward because the offense is blocking you. It becomes a roadblock to you moving forward. Their offense toward Jesus became a roadblock. In fact, in Mark chapter 6, verse 3, the message translation, it says that the congregation tripped over what little they knew about Jesus, and they fell sprawling, and they never got any further. They weren't able to get past, I know you. Dude, Jesus, don't, don't come at me like that. Don't come at me like that. We were in the same classes. We were running around the same hills, and now you are telling me that you are the promised Messiah? They got offended. What is offense designed to do? Offense is a tool of Satan designed to do two things. It's cause, he's, he designs offense to cause you to misplace your focus and to bring about separation or division. Whenever Satan anoints people, and Satan will put people on assignment to get on your nerves. He will empower people to go about trying to offend you, trying to get you in your feelings. He's after two things. One, he's after your focus. He wants you to focus on the hurt. He wants you to focus on the pain. He wants you to focus on what they did to you, what they said to you. He wants you to focus on how that made you feel. And again, I told you that over in Luke chapter 17, verse 1, Jesus said, I need you to understand, disciple. I need you to understand, believer. You're not in heaven. You're surrounded by real, flawed people. People are going to do what people do. Because people are going to people, Jesus said, offenses will come. If you look at that word offense in the original language, it means, it literally means the part of a trap to which bait is attached to entrap an animal. The root word of that word offense means the part of a trap. You're trying to trap an animal. You're trying to catch an animal. So you're going to put bait on a part of the trap. You're hoping to do two things. You want the bait to be attractive because you need the animal to focus on the bait. But you also need the animal to focus on the bait to the point that they don't see the trap. You got to hide the trap. If they see the trap, they're not going to go after the bait. What is Jesus saying by using this word? He is saying that Satan baits us with offense. He's after your focus. He wants you to focus on how they hurt me. You don't know what they did to me, Pastor MK. I cannot forgive her. I can't forgive my mama. I refuse to forgive. He wants you to focus on the bait so that you don't see the trap. If we're trying to trap the animal, we're trying to get the animal to lose their freedom. Satan is after your freedom. So he'll bait you with offense. He'll allow your boss to acknowledge everybody but you. He'll anoint your siblings, and our family members know how to push our buttons. He'll anoint our siblings to get us offended because he's after your focus. He wants you to misplace your focus so you don't see the trap, but he's also, he's also trying to separate and divide. Come on, teach, teach. Satan knew that if Jesus goes back to this congregation, this town, He's going to turn the place upside down. He's going to come out healing folk. He's going to come out delivering folk. So I got to get the congregation offended at him so that they can separate themselves from him. So that they can separate themselves from what God could do. Satan is always trying to separate 
and divide. How do offenses come? They come through words. It was what Jesus was saying this day. This scripture is fulfilled. It was what he said. Offenses come through actions. Sometimes it's what people do. Come on, Jesus. Come on. I know you haven't been away for a little bit, but don't come back up in here. Don't come in Nazareth acting brand new. We know your mama. That's what they were saying. We know your mama. We know your brothers. Your sisters live right around the corner. Don't come up in here acting brand new. They were offended by his actions. Sometimes offense comes because of disappointment. I'm believing God to send a deliverer. I'm believing God to send a Messiah. We're oppressed. We're under the Roman government. We're waiting on God to send help. And the help that God is going to send us is in the form of little Jesus. They were disappointed. And sometimes offense will come because people disappoint you. You were there for them in their time of need. You showed up. You were present. But the moment that you hit adversity... The moment that you have a challenge, the moment that you're in need, all of the people that you were there for, they're nowhere to be found. You were calling them, but they're not calling you. Sometimes we're disappointed in people, but if we'll be honest, if we'll really be honest and take off our church mask, sometimes our disappointment is we're disappointed in God. I prayed, I stood in faith. I did everything that I knew to do, but God, you did not answer my prayer. I prayed for them to get better, and they didn't. I prayed for this situation to turn around. Sometimes, if we'll really be honest, sometimes our offense is rooted in disappointment at God. Sometimes offenses come through the preacher and their teachings. God's word is truth, but he has to get it out through human vessels. Amen. And there are going to be times where we don't say it right. Amen. We ain't perfect. There are going to be times where we won't say it right. And how we say it will offend you. Sometimes we can say it as perfectly as can be said. Sometimes the truth itself is offensive. Sometimes when God holds up a mirror, he holds up the truth of his word. Sometimes the teachings can be offensive. It would have been one thing if Jesus had said, I'm the Messiah, and the people just didn't believe him. But man, Jesus, Jesus was bold. Jesus was bold. You meditate and look at that scripture. The Bible says that Jesus began to see the room shift. He began to see the congregation kind of frowning up their nose against him. And the scripture says that he began to call out their unbelief from the pulpit. He began to tell them, hey, listen, I know y'all don't believe this. I know y'all don't believe what I'm saying. But y'all aren't the first people in history to not believe one of God's prophets. That's what he told them. He said there were Old Testament prophets. Elijah, y'all ain't believe him, but God sent, God sent Elijah. God sent Elisha. Y'all didn't believe him. So it's not surprising to me that y'all aren't believing me. And the Bible says that they got so upset at him calling them out, so upset at his teaching, that they tried to throw him off of a cliff. How do I overcome it? If Satan is going to make sure that people offend you, if he's going to make sure that you're not going to get through life, not going to get through school, not going to get through work without people offending you, how do you overcome it? Because God wants you to overcome it. God does not want you to get stuck in the actions of other people. I want to give you five keys to overcoming offense. Number one, when you sense that you are or have been offended, be honest with yourself and decide to forgive. When you sense, okay, what they said to me, what my classmate said to me offended me. What my spouse said or how my spouse said it offended me. What my parents did or didn't do offended me. What the pastor did or didn't do offended me. When you sense that you are 
or are or have been offended, be honest with yourself. God can't help us if we're pretending. Be honest with yourself. That bothered me. That hurt me. I know I'm a grown man, but that hurt me. That be honest with yourself, and you got to make a choice to forgive. Sometimes Christians say, well, you know, I'm trying to forgive. You know, I'm, I'm in the process of forgiving. No, what that person is saying is that I am waiting on giving, getting a forgiveness feeling. When you are truly offended, you're not going to feel like releasing it. When people have hurt you, you're not going to have this warm and fuzzy. But here's what you have to remember. To hold on to that grudge is a choice. You got to choose to hold on to that grudge. And you're going to have to choose to forgive. You're not going to slide into this decision on accident. Jesus said over in Mark chapter 11, verse 25, and whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. Can you forgive someone by praying and sitting down? Absolutely. But Jesus said, when you stand praying, I take that literal. I take that literal. So here's how I do it. Here's how I do it. Someone has offended me. Jesus said, when I stand, pray that I'm to forgive them. I go to God in prayer, and I'm making a decision to pray. The person that hurt me does not deserve my feelings. They're just the beneficiary of my obedience. The person who offended you, they're not going to deserve it. But they are going to benefit. But this is between you and God. God, you said, you said that I'm to stand, pray, and forgive. God, what she did hurt me. I know you're God. I know you know what she said. I know you know what she did, but I'm going to tell you anyway. God, I ain't like how she said that. I thought that what he did was wrong. God, it was nothing right about what they did, and God, here's how it made me feel. I know you know it, but I'm getting it out of me. You're going to have to get it out of you. God, I felt embarrassed by what they did. I felt like I wanted to curse. I wanted to fight. But God, you said that when I stand, pray that I'm to forgive. So God, I forgive them. God, I turn the person over to you because of what you told me to do. You're going to have to make a decision to forgive. How do you overcome offense? Number two, you're going to have to spend time getting rooted in God's Word. You're going to have to spend time getting rooted in God's Word. Mark chapter 4, 16 through 17, Jesus said, These are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. When they heard the word on forgiveness in church and they didn't have anything to forgive, it sounded really good. It sounded like, yeah, I can do that. I can put that into practice. Keep on, Pastor. Keep on. Keep on. But Jesus said... These believers have no root in themselves. He said, so they endure only for a time and afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately Jesus said they're offended. When they leave out of church and they hit a hard place. My Lord. And Jesus said that the affliction comes for the word's sake. Sometimes Satan will stir people up again, to get you to misplace your focus and to get you off track. And you haven't done anything wrong. They're talking about you and cracking on you at school not because you've done anything wrong, only because you've done something right. Sometimes people are going to talk about you because they're jealous. I want what you want. My life doesn't match your worse, so I'm going to stir this up. Jesus said that the people who don't have root in themselves, it was Pastor Mike's word, but not theirs. 
It was the preacher's revelation, but they didn't spend enough time in it after church to really get, get it down on the inside of them. Jesus said that people endure only four times. Psalm chapter 119, verse 165 says, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. That does not mean that offenses won't come. That's not a contradiction. It is saying that if you spend time in God's Word, if you spend time meditating on what He says, Satan can't trip you up with the offense. If you are in front of a congregation telling them your purpose, telling them, I've been sent by God to help y'all, and they reject you, push you out, we don't want anything to do with you. It wasn't just strangers. The Bible says over in John that Jesus' own brothers did not believe in him. In another instance, Jesus was preaching. His mom and his family showed up at the service to do an intervention. We think Jesus has lost his mind, but we love little Jesus. So we got to step in here and get him back on track. The Bible says that when Jesus heard, they came to him, stopped the sermon, hey, your mom, and, your mom and your brothers, your family is out here. The Bible says that Jesus knew what they were trying to do. He didn't even go out and greet them. He said, who are my mom? Who are my family? He said, the people who are my family are those who are going to obey the word. Why did Jesus not get offended at the rejection? Cool. You tripping about me, I'm going to trip about you. He did not trip about the rejection from the congregation, and it was real rejection. These were real words. These were real grown men picking him up, trying to throw him off a cliff. He didn't respond and retaliate because he had spent enough time getting rooted in who God said that he was. You may not believe it. Jesus is thinking, you may not believe it. You may reject the fact that I'm called by God, but I've spent enough time with him to know what he says about me. And your rejection and your words will only have the weight that I attach to them. The reason that what they're saying about you is bothering you like it is is because you haven't gotten rooted in what God says. When you spend enough time hearing what he says about you, hearing what he says that you can do. Pastor Mike just gave him that church. He going to be leading the church, but that's just because he his son. He just going to be leading the church. Pastor Mike just gave that to him. He's a bit more qualified to lead that church. If I don't have a revelation of what God has said to me. If I hadn't spent enough time to understand, you may reject the call, but I ain't called myself. I've spent enough time with him to know I am called. Then the Bible says that those who love the law, love the word, spend enough time in it, they'll overcome the offense. How do I overcome offense? Number three, get a revelation from the Holy Spirit of your set place. This will help you with church hurt. Church hurt is real. I wish that saved people didn't offend, but they do. Saved people will tell your business. Saved people will talk about you behind your back. Say people will reject you. And here's the problem. You can leave Faith Chapel, go somewhere else. But wherever you go, no matter how amazing the church is, no matter how great the pastor is, you spend enough time there, you're going to run into people. You stay plugged in enough there, you're going to run into people. And people are going to do what people are going to do. It's just a different flavor of it. But you spend enough time with them. There's no such thing as a perfect church. So if I'm going to get offended here, if I leave here and I'm going to get offended somewhere else, then we have to spend enough time with God 
to find out what church has he called me to. And when they don't say it right at the team meeting, I got to ask myself, did what they say change what God said? When they don't celebrate me, when I don't get a medal, when they send the email out acknowledging everybody and don't say squat about what I did, and I worked harder than all of them. Did that change the instruction that God gave me? If God tells you to leave, leave. Because the worst place that you could be is Faith Chapel when he's told you to be somewhere else. But the reverse is true. The reverse is true. The worst place that you could be is to leave here, go somewhere else, when God's instruction to you was to be here, was to stay here. You have to get a revelation from the Holy Spirit. God, where have you called me? He said, I will give you pastors. Not we're going to vote on it. Not we're going to take a poll. I'm going to get your input. You get mine. He said, I'm going to set pastors over you. I'm going to give you pastors. You have to take time to listen to him. Number four, how do you overcome offense? Put a guard over your mouth. My God today. My God today. If you want to know if you're really growing as a Christian, pay attention to this key. Because immature people get offended and they tell. They get offended God, you told me to forgive, so I'm forgiving, I'm standing, I'm praying. But listen, when I get on that phone call and I start hearing other people and how my offender did the same thing to others, yeah, you're right, you're right. He is like that. She is like that. What do I do when I am offended? What should you do? You've prayed the prayer. Now you got to put a guard over your mouth. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 32 says that if you have been foolish in lifting up yourself, or if you have thought evil. The Bible says, put your hand over your mouth. Is there any sin in my response? Am I slandering the person's reputation in any way? Bible says that when you get offended, this is what your posture has to be. Married people. How many married people we got in the house? Amen. 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 <laughs> Proverbs did not give us, married people, Proverbs did not give us any exceptions for our spouse. It did not say, don't tell your coworkers, put your hand over your mouth with your church members, but you get a pass with your spouse because you know your spouse ain't going to say nothing. <laughs> so, Michelle, let me tell you what she said. Michelle, that's my wife, let me tell you what they did. Oftentimes, when we're hurt, we're looking for support. We're looking for people to rally around us and married people. We know that we're going to get that in our spouse. If I am mad, by the time I get through telling Michelle what some of y'all have done, she going to be mad too. <laughs> I'm going to be mad. She, if you know Michelle, is going to be more mad than me. And I can forgive. I've moved on. And Michelle still looking at folk with a side eye. <laughs> Jesus did not give us, married people, any exceptions for our spouses. Men, men, your job is to protect your wife. Amen. Amen. You're not protecting her when you take your offense, tell it to her. That's, a good one. That's not protecting her. There's some things that I have to quarantine. I have to take it to God, tell him, 
but I'm not going to tell Michelle because unforgiveness is contagious. And that leads me to the fifth key. What do I do to overcome offense? You promptly confront those who have offended you. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18, verse 15, now if your brother or your sister, father, mom, cousin, whoever, sins against you, go and tell them their fault between you and him alone. Between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. Why did Jesus put stipulations around it? Why did he say, if your brother has offended you, Go and tell him, but tell him and you alone, it's because Jesus knows that bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness is contagious. And he's teaching you, he's teaching me to quarantine the offense. Someone gets COVID, they contract COVID. The CDC and all of us know that they got to isolate themselves, they got to quarantine for at least five days. But the question is why? Why does the person who's contracted COVID need to isolate? Why do they need to quarantine? It's because COVID is contagious. You spend enough time in close proximity to someone who has it, it can spread to you. Unforgiveness is contagious. Bitterness is contagious. Resentment is contagious. Jesus says, I want you to quarantine it, just like you quarantine that person with COVID. I need you to quarantine it so that it does not spread. On next week, we're going to look at, after I've forgiven, I prayed the prayer, but I still got feelings. I prayed the prayer, but they broken trust. How do I navigate through broken trust? Do we just jump back in and the relationship is back where it was? If we said that trust and forgiveness are not the same thing, forgiveness and reconciliation are not the same thing, how do I navigate through those factors? Amen?